Today's episode of The Buyer's Mind is brought to you by Home Street Bank. For all your banking needs, both business and personal, go to homestreetbank.com. How willing are you to put yourself out there? How bold are you when it comes to getting the sale? Let's talk about it on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Well, welcome once again to The Buyer's Mind, where we investigate exactly what is going on in the minds of prospects who are considering a purchase decision. That's what this podcast is all about. It's about taking a stroll through the buyer's brain and getting that to know that customer so well that the sale begins to roll out right in front of you. And I do believe that. I think when you know your customer really well, you can reverse engineer your sales presentation accordingly. I'm your host, Jeff Shore. You can read the full bio in the show notes, or you can visit jeffshore.com. And while you're there, you can hop over to our book page and look particularly at a book I wrote a few years ago called Be Bold and Win the Sale. It's going to line up with our discussion today. Now, the fact of the matter is that oftentimes we look at sales as a, an uncomfortable process. There are a lot of uncomfortable moments in the sales process, and I think that uh, salespeople who are really great. It's not that they're not uncomfortable. It's just that they respond differently to that discomfort. They've built up the right habits when they are uncomfortable, and they can practice boldness in the face of that uh, discomfort. Uh, joined by our show producer, Paul Murphy. Hey, Murph, I wrote that book to help salespeople to embrace discomfort uh, in the sales path, and I wrote it because uh, I'm kind of a comfort addict. I love all things uh, comfortable. Do you feel the same way? Who doesn't? Who doesn't want to feel comfortable, right? I mean, I, I think the the big thing is challenging ourselves, and that's why getting up to work out in the morning, you know, whether it's 5 a.m., 6 a.m., you're, you're in bed. You're all harm. You're under the yeah. covers. Why would you want to get out and right. be cold and lift weights? That's hard. But if you don't challenge yourself, you don't grow. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, the fact is that we always have these choices to make. It. My elliptical machine is uncomfortable. My sofa is comfortable, right? My uh, uh, broccoli, uncomfortable. Cheeseburger, comfortable. And we've always got these decisions, uh, even in the sales process. Asking for the sale might be uncomfortable. Not asking seems comfortable. We're constantly wanting to drive towards the area of comfort. It just does not make it Right. And I just want to challenge you in today's episode, and as we listen to uh, our, our guest, Michelle Weinstein, here in, in just a little while, you're going to hear that sense of boldness. And I think it really does identify the difference between great salespeople and everybody else. Uh, great salespeople are great because of the way that they respond to that discomfort. We're going to find that discomfort in our world, and we always tend to interpret it as some sort of threat or some sort of pain. And, but the fact of the matter is, it's natural. It's normal. It's normal in life. It's normal in our sales presentation. It's what we do about it. It leads us to our quote of the day. And I'm going to quote Wesley from The Princess Bride, one of my favorite movies. And he once said, life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Or to quote William Faulkner, given the choice between the experience of pain and nothing, I would choose pain. And I think the idea here is that there are lessons to be learned in times of adversity that we cannot learn in times of prosperity, that we are going to find discomfort. We are going to find that sense of mental pain all throughout the course of the process. If that never happened, if we never experienced that, we probably wouldn't get a sale. We probably wouldn't be talking to a real customer. So the question is not whether you're going to face discomfort. The question is, what are you going to do about it? And I think great salespeople, and you're going to hear this from Michelle Weinstein in just a little bit, they train their brains on how they're going to push through. They train their brain on how to embrace that discomfort, to recognize that every discomfort is an opportunity. There's uh, an old Zen saying, stupid, like there are new Zen sayings. Anyway, there's a Zen saying that says, the obstacle is the path. The obstacle is the path. It's not on the path. It's not in the way of the path. It is the path. And if we can look at it, we could say on every, on the other side of every discomfort is a great opportunity if we're willing to embrace that. Well, before we get to our interview with Michelle, I want to just give you a, a tip here. And it's, it's going to sound a little heady, but stay with me on it. 
But the tip is this, to practice the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy is the leading therapy that is used by psychologists and counselors who are helping people to deal with uh, addictions in their life. So I kind of look at comfort as an addiction. I want to be comfortable in all ways. So think about applying this for just a moment. Cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive thinking, behavioral acting. It's about thinking before I act. It's about making a decision of how I'm going to respond before I'm in that uncomfortable moment. So I want you to be thinking right now about the moments of discomfort in your own sales presentation. Whether it's a price objection, whether it's making a prospecting call or a follow-up call, if it's asking for the sale, if it's dealing with that tough issue that keeps nagging, maybe it's just dealing with snarky people. I don't know what it is. But I want you to think right now about those moments in the sales presentation when you feel uncomfortable. Because you can decide right now how you will respond the next time that happens. You can prepare your brain now. And the beautiful thing is that if you prepare your brain now, you're doing it out of the logical side of your brain. If you wait to respond until you are in that moment, you're probably going to respond out of the emotional side of the brain. So I just want to suggest to you here that if you take a little time right now and think, what makes me uncomfortable? plan in advance for how you're going to deal with that discomfort. It will raise your aptitude, it'll raise your confidence level, and you'll be a, a much better salesperson and a much bolder salesperson in that moment. All right, I'm joined by uh, Michelle Weinstein, the pitch queen herself uh, and the hostess of the Sales Unfiltered podcast. She is a driven salesperson, a walking picture of persistence and influence. Uh, it's really been interesting to study her work, and that has led her to some amazing deals that we're going to talk about shortly. But please welcome the pitch queen herself, Michelle Weinstein. How are you, Michelle? I'm awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me today. Uh, hey, your website says, and I'm just going to quote it directly, I teach entrepreneurs how to sell without being sleazy. So let's start right there. What is it about sales that would cause people to fear the sleaze factor? I mean, why is that still a thing? You know, I'm not really sure why it's still a thing, but I do have an, an insight. And do you guys ever go to the malls? and you see the little kiosks down the aisles of the malls and sure. they're like, can I twirl your hair? Do you want a sample of lotion that I don't really care about? I didn't come to the mall. I just want to go to the Apple store. Right. Or, you know, when you go to the car lot, you sometimes just want to go to CarMax because it's like hassle free and you won't mm -hmm. get hounded by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's why the sleaze is still out there. I think when it comes to the word sales and with entrepreneurs and a lot of the people that I help selling products anywhere from like $30,000 to $3,000, oh. or it should be reversed, 3,000 to 30,000 yeah. in service-based businesses like coaching or, you know, I've been working a lot with these CPAs that are doing awesome tax planning. It's a different way of selling something. Mm -hmm. And it's just how to do it without being pushy, without being sleazy, and really being able to help the other person, because it's all about them anyway, right? Well, and this is interesting from your perspective, because your clientele are, is, for the most part, these are entrepreneurs who would not only consider themselves to be profound sales professionals. It's not like a, there's a title that says salesperson on a card somewhere. You're working with entrepreneurs and you say, you've got the great product, you've got the great service, now let's figure out how to sell it. Is that, did I, did I size that up yes, correctly? Yes, that's, that's exactly right. Because I think a lot of us as entrepreneurs or, you know, if, uh, I work with someone and he's a film major and a lot of times they don't teach sales in like business school. They don't teach sales in any technical school. And we work, I also work with a lot of CPAs too. And especially them, I mean, they are the most trusted advisor with your financial advisor and other people in your world, but they're not taught how to really sell their services to benefit their clients at the best level that they can serve them at mm -hmm. and really to benefit them too at the end of the day. Right. So yeah. there's a lot of things that we start our businesses as entrepreneurs because we have a great product or we have a great service. However, we sometimes forget that we signed up for a 24-7 sales career. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I love those stories of people who are so strong on both sides. Like I've, following the career, for example, of uh, of uh, Sarah Blakey, who started uh, Spanx. And you know, she had a great product, yeah. but it didn't matter how great her product is. She knew how to put herself out there and uh, to not take no for an answer. It sounds like that's a lot of your MO uh, as well. Uh-huh. And, now, speaking of that, boy, in studying your background, Michelle, you're kind of all over the place. And some people are going to say, hey, focus on a niche and just stay there. You seem to kind of shun that advice. uh, It seems to me like your approach is a little bit more like, hey, life is a buffet. Let's get full. (laughs) Well, life is always the buffet and let's get full, but I definitely have a niche. And it's for those people and entrepreneurs that are selling something of a higher value price product. They've Mm -hmm. been in business at least two years. And they really want to take their business maybe from like 500 to a million to like 1.5 to 2 million. That's definitely my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And again, if your products have two levels where maybe you have a $3,000 to $6,000 original offer, and then you've got a high value offer like a mastermind group or something like that, Mm -hmm. then that is my specialty. So it's really like coaches, Um, entrepreneurs or specialty people like CPAs where they are doing a high level service Mm -hmm. for their clients that they are charging about 10,000 to 20,000 per client per year. Mm -hmm. So that is my specialty. I do not serve every single thing in the buffet. I am not the appetizer, the salad, (laughs) the main entree and the dessert. Right. I like to say I'm just the dessert. Yeah. Love it. I love it. In your own career, you've successfully pitched to some really tough audiences, right? I mean, audiences that that oh, yeah. most people would love to get in front of. We're talking Costco and Nordstrom and professional sports team uh, teams. What is the secret to get into those types of audiences and then to successfully selling when you get their attention in the first place? Yeah, you know what I say the secret is to a lot of this stuff is really putting yourself out there. And I love how Mel Robbins always says, like, selling is not about um, just it happening on its own. It's not a thinking thing. It's a putting it into action. And what I think the main secret is, is I don't think too much about what's going to happen. I don't think about the outcome. What I do is I put it into action. So like with Costco or with the vitamin shop or pitching on Shark Tank or working with Nordstrom's or working with like 16 of the major league baseball teams this past year, I'm selling something of high value, but I'm putting it into action. I'm not thinking about, well, I wonder if what they're going to say to me. I wonder if they're going to tell me no. I wonder if they're going to use us or somebody else. Mm -hmm. Like all of those thoughts actually stop us from taking action. You know, it's fa- I've been studying this recently, the phenomenon called anticipated regret and the, the what psychologists refer to as catastrophizing, because that's exactly what you're talking about. If I overthink what the outcome might be and my mind wanders into that negative space and then I catastrophize, I come up with this story of this worst case scenario is that, you know, Costco is not just going to say no, they're going to say no, and they're going to hate me and they're going to get a court injunction and they're going to assault my children at school. And, you know what? I mean, it's ridiculous after a while. But you're right. We overthink it too much. And, uh, yeah. and pretty soon we won't take any action at all. So so your advice is don't let your mind go there. Just put yourself out there. Just take the steps. It's really just put it into action. And I also love like building that confidence that I have built over the last 20 years. It didn't come overnight. Every day I put something into practice. And I like to always encourage entrepreneurs and people who are just starting out to go practice asking for things in the real world. Because when you start to practice the ask, that's when you get to start increasing your sales, especially when you're focused on if you're selling something between three and $6,000 or a high level mastermind program or Mm. high level coaching program, like you really need to get comfortable and confident in Mm -hmm. the ask. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing too, like you were saying earlier, it's like that self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, do you know when you start to think about somebody, they end up calling you or texting you? Have you ever had that happen? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you're going to think that 
you know, if I was to think that vitamin shop wouldn't choose me mm -hmm. over all the other competition, they probably would not have chose me. Mm -hmm. But with the confidence and the belief, and this is, where, this is leading me to my next thing, you have to be able to believe in yourself. And believing in yourself comes with taking action and building up that confidence every piece of the way. So the, the belief isn't just, uh, I think I can, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough. I've got good enough, gosh darn it, people like me. It's the idea that you're, you're saying belief is a, a verb. You, you have to believe it enough to act on it. It's not enough to believe on it. If the belief doesn't turn into action, then what difference does it make? Correct. 1000%. And believing in yourself also comes from trying something and succeeding, trying something again and succeeding. Mm -hmm. So it's building on top of the confidence every single time. But in order to do that, you have to put yourself out there. Yeah. You have to ask for things. You have to put yourself in a place to be told no or be rejected. And how are you going to act and put into action or what are you going to put into action to get over that next hurdle? Because ultimately, entrepreneurs or, you know, people start these businesses because they love what they do. But this like bad four letter word sale gets thrown in the mix mm -hmm. and it just throws them, you know, into a frenzy. Right. When really, if you can come from the place of serving people, you're going to be able to make a bigger impact and then focus on really what you're good at. Because the more sales you have, the more you can do what you're really good at. You, you uh, if if we look at the bold scale, okay. So on one side, you're the most timid person that ever walked on the face of the earth. On the other side, you're as bold as bold gets. Uh, I think it's clear to say that you live on the bold side of the scale. But am I hearing that you you grew into that? Is or, or do you consider yeah. yourself to be a naturally bold person? Um, I would say I definitely grew into that. I mean, it didn't just happen overnight. I, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time and I was thinking about it the other day and I thought my first job was teaching swim classes when I was, well, that was my first job. I was a lifeguard at the YMCA mm -hmm. and I started teaching swim classes in people's backyards. And that was my first time of starting my own business. Yeah. But really it started when I was 18 and I was working in a bar in New York, serving up cocktails to people at the age of 18. Mm -hmm where in New York you could serve up, but you couldn't consume until you were 21. <laughs> so I got, you know, I started early and a lot of other people I talked to that are really amazing, you know, and what they're doing today, you know, they had a door to door sales job back in the day, or they, they, they had some challenging, difficult sales jobs that were pretty low level, but it built that resilience and that confidence that I think a lot of us have today, but mm -hmm. it took me the last 20 years. Right. Sure. Uh, you've done some some pretty strong pitches uh, to some pretty big name organizations. They haven't always been a success. You've had to deal with rejection. Yeah. Uh, what what are the what are the secrets? What are the tips for when you get you get the no? When you get the no? Yeah. Uh, well, I have definitely been told no my fair share of times. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the biggest no that I got was when um, we were inside the vitamin shop and we did a six month test, but it took six months to get that test. So it was about a 12 month period I was working with them mm -hmm. and their CEO decided to retire. And I was like, uh oh, I know this might not end up very, very, yeah, this might not end up good. And the day that my favorite person there, Doug Jones, called me and he said, Michelle, we gave it our all. We tried our best, but unfortunately, we're going to have to stop all new projects going forward because they got a new CEO. It was an accomplishment and a disaster all in one day. I was like trying not to cry. Mm -hmm. It didn't really work very, very well. I think I was depressed for about 48 hours. Yeah. But I looked at all of the things from the positive. What were we able to create? What did we try? Look at what we overcame. Look at what we accomplished. And I feel like the last 10 years of my life has been that way. Mm -hmm. We've done some amazing things, but everything came to an end. Right. You know, like right. that was just one of uh, probably 10 big experiences that I had in the last 10 years. And it really built this thick skin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now when I hear like, no, or something's going to end, there's always something better on the other side. Right. 
There's yeah. always some door that opens when one slams in your face. And this one was a slam to my face because at the time we were pretty profitable with my last company during these six months. Yeah. Then we went from doing really well to losing about 30,000 to 50,000 a month overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That, that'll be a wake up call. Uh, but I, I get the sense just in talking to you, you bill yourself as the pitch queen, but I, I think you're probably, um, you could be just as easily known as the reinvention queen, right? Like you're, is the it, reinvention is, queen. yeah, well, I sure. Like that. I've yeah. never heard that one before. No, I think it's a noble trait because I think what, that's one of the problems is people ride a horse for too long. And, you know, sometimes that horse needs to just lie down and take a rest. Uh, so there are times <laughs> when we to have die. to just, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but I also get the sense that you're sort of a change freak. Is that sound about right? Um, no, I definitely wouldn't be a change freak. I mean, even like in my personal life, I've lived in the same place for like 11 years. I'm not that person that moves every six months. But I think in business and being an entrepreneur and also like with sales or even just with my new pitch queen business in the last six months, you have to be able to pivot quickly. You have to be able to think quickly and change quickly. And I would say one of the biggest mistakes, and I put this in my ebook that I have on my website, right on the homepage, mm -hmm. thepitchqueen.com. Mm -hmm. It's like those 10 secrets that I wish I would have known when I first started my business 10 years ago. Yeah. The biggest one is that you're going to have to pivot. You're going to have to change and you can't keep hanging on to something for so long. But listening to a lot of Mel Robbins lately, your brain tricks you into trying to keep going at this thing that you put so much time into, so much passion, so much work, mm -hmm. tears, you know, they call it blood, sweat, and tears for a reason. And we keep working at something, even though it's not working, but we know it's not working, but we keep trying anyway, because we feel like this is going to be the thing. And I like to say, I always had this carrot dangling in my face. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you have to be able to see past the carrots dangling in your face. And if you can master that, you won't have to do any of the stuff I had to do. <laughs> sure. Yeah, right, right. Well, but that's part of why you, you have the great opportunity to have the business you have now because you can walk people through the potential landmines that are out there because yeah. you, you already know what it's like to step on that and the damage that gets done. And that's a, a very valuable service. Hey, tell us about uh, the Shark Tank experience. The Shark Tank experience. Well, which part do you want to know? I mean, I it was season four. Mm -hmm. I I was extremely professionally annoying. It's one of the things I teach to a lot of entrepreneurs on how to be professionally annoying, especially mm -hmm. if you're focusing on selling high ticket offers or big, you know, investments that mm -hmm. people make in you. You need to do a lot of follow up. So I was super professionally annoying and, you know, I was one of 140 people out of 30,000 people that applied season four and mm -hmm. got to pitch to five of the best investors, I would say, in the country. Sure. And it was the best experience of my life. And I think when you get those experiences, it's also a way to build that tough skin mm -hmm. and build that resilience sure. that I have. It right. was a lot of work, a lot of prep, but a lot of those skills I use today in my business. Mm -hmm. And they trickle down because I like to say how you do anything is how you do everything. Love that. That's a great quote. That's going to be a Jeff Shore original by next Thursday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was it? What... Yeah, no, Shark Tank was great. I yeah. mean, I stood there for an hour and a half. I did my pitch. I got drilled with questions left and right. I was wearing high heels. My feet started to hurt. Um, but, you know, you build rock solid resilience and it's all about those sharks at the time sure you know yeah, it's right. how it, what's in it for them right. how is this going to benefit them yeah yeah who who was uh your favorite shark and who was your least favorite shark my favorite shark was barbara that yeah, day but i coordinated with the producers mm -hmm. because my last company was in food uh -huh. and i thought that my only hope was her yeah but uh it it was too complicated of a food business for mm, her. Mm -hmm. And my least favorite shark that day was Robert. Oh, really? He was definitely not very fun, no. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Interesting. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's such a great show. And, and I just I love that they, they, these are real people on there doing their thing. And you, you get to see the passion that uh, that comes out. Hey, give us a piece of advice before we wrap it up here. Uh, when you're looking at it and, and you're, let, let's just advance the clock many, many, many years into the future. And you've decided okay. you're going to hang it up and you're going to go live on a beach somewhere. And uh, what, what, what will you have wanted people to say about your career? Not necessarily about your entire life's mission, but about your career. What, what what do you want people to say about you one day? So what I would want people to say about this portion of my career mm -hmm. is that Michelle, the pitch queen, whatever you want to call me, yeah. inspired me to take action and just do one thing that focused around sales on my business every day. If it was practicing asking people in line at Starbucks for things, great. But really inspired her people to take action to grow their businesses because i think a lot of times we have great services we have great products but we don't ever ask for the sale mm -hmm. and if you don't ask for the sale from your clients and customers then you're actually doing them a disservice by not offering your gifts to them yeah. right like we all have these gifts but what i have seen so often is that we're scared about what they're going to say. So if you can, if I can just help everybody who listens to me, watches me just overcome those no's and rejections. So you're able to share your gifts with your clients, then I've done my job. I love it. I love it. Michelle Weinstein, The Pitch Queen. And you can go to thepitchqueen.com. You can see where you can follow Michelle on social media. You can also uh, uh, download uh, the ebook that she has right there on the front page of her site. Uh, what a, what a, a very inspirational. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for being on The Buyer's Mind, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. It was an honor. Well, Murph, uh, that was fun. I uh, I think, uh, how do you describe uh, Michelle? Uh, perhaps to say she's a hoot. <laughs> would would, would that do it? Bold. Bold was the word that uh, you, you said, and uh, bold is what I'm going with. Yeah, absolutely. And I loved the fact that she approached it from the perspective that boldness is not something that's just, it's not genetic, right? She, it, it took her a long time to be able to build that confidence, but I, I loved it because she learned over time that if she got a rejection, it wasn't the end of the world, but if she got a yes, it built her confidence to be able to continue and to move on to the next opportunity. That was really great, wasn't it? Well, it comes back to what we've already talked about on our program time and time again. It's not about us. It's mm -hmm. about our customer. Sure. And when we have that perspective, all of a sudden getting a no means, well, we're just not meeting their needs, so it's okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love to her conversation about the idea of just put yourself out there. And the concept that we, we tend to self-filter so much to the really to the detriment of our own customers because we're not able to serve their needs if we are self-filtering and self-correcting even to the extent of saying oh, i don't think i should call or i don't think i should talk or i don't think i should listen this is the idea this is what michelle said that i thought was so valuable she said i don't think too much about what's going to happen i just take action and that's the idea you decide and you believe, and then collectively that puts you out there. And if you don't take that action, then it doesn't really matter in the first place. So I think this is a great advice for all of us here to look at it and say, stop thinking about what might happen because your brain will generally go negative. Just put yourself out there. Just take the action because when you do that, you're gonna find the best chances of success. Otherwise, what are you gonna have? regret you're gonna end up with regret that you didn't take the action that you know that you could have taken so just follow the advice put yourself out there it's not gonna hurt you're not gonna die put yourself out there well i just i have to tell you it inspires me to see how michelle just puts herself out there but the other thing that it inspires me is the rewards for putting yourself out there. The fact of the matter is that when we face a discomfort and then give in to that discomfort, we get this cheap temporary reward called comfort, but there's always this nagging sense that we know we're not doing what we're really supposed to be doing. On the other hand, 
when we face discomfort with boldness and we just go for it the way we just heard Michelle all throughout our career, just go for it. I have to tell you, the rewards of boldness are awesome. (laughs) They really are. When you do the bold thing, what happens? You're more productive. You're more effective. You are more confident. You sleep better at night. You have more energy. You're more value to your team. All of these things are a tremendous reward if you practice boldness. If this is something that's resonating with you, you may want to pick up a copy of Be Bold and Win the Sale. You can get it right off of JeffShore.com or go over to Amazon. But the idea here is train your brain for those moments of discomfort. It's one of the healthiest things you can do if you want to be a better sales professional and if you want to live a better life. Well, that's a wrap on today's podcast. Hope you enjoyed this episode of The Buyer's Mind. You can find everything you need over at jeffshore.com, including a link over to uh, buy the book, Be Bold and Win the Sale. I just want to challenge you one last time. Uh, If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. If you want to improve, you got to do something about it. So take the time to do that now. But until next time, should I go out there, everybody, and change someone's world? 